the ancient Egyptians uh, had a very clear idea of the vast antiquity of their origins. And this is expressed in what are called king lists. Uh, and in fact, uh, Egyptologists derive the orthodox chronology of Egypt from ancient Egyptian king lists, one of which we are looking at here. Uh, and this is just another way that I think the Egyptologists cherry pick the past. Uh, because uh, this king list in which the pharaoh um, Seti I is showing his young son Ramesses II a list of all the pharaohs who'd ruled before their time, and this is found in the temple of Seti I at Abydos. It's rather intriguing because it doesn't stop annoyingly for Egyptologists. It doesn't stop in the first dynasty in 3000 BC. It just keeps on going back for thousands and thousands and thousands of years earlier. In fact, it goes back about 36,000 years. So Egyptologists, they say that stuff earlier than 3000 BC, they were just making that up. That's all myths. But the stuff from 3000 BC down to the end of ancient Egypt, we'll buy that. That's history, because that fits with our prejudices about the past. Clear sense of a remote antiquity in the ancient Egyptian story of themselves. And I personally think that the ancient Egyptians knew more about their own past than Egyptologists do. Uh, and uh, behind the Temple of Seti I is this amazing structure, the Osirion, which is about 50 feet lower and which was covered in sediment uh, until uh, the early 1900s. Uh, when it was uh, exposed and excavated. This temple has been given to Seti I because it's very close to the temple of Seti I. Uh, and because there are a couple of, down in this corridor here, there are a couple of inscriptions that relate to Seti I. My suggestion is that Seti I, and I'm not the only person to make this suggestion, that Seti I indeed did know that temple, and he did put some inscriptions in that corridor, but I don't think he built it at all. Uh, I think it belongs to a much earlier time and to a very different style of architecture, a megalithic style of architecture uh, that uh, we do find elsewhere in Egypt. There's the entrance gateway to the uh, Osirion and we have to ask ourselves what's involved in moving blocks like this and um, in answer to that question the Egyptologists will tell you thousands of slaves yeah. laboring in loincloths but uh, I much prefer this idea really which is a little bit of magic, a little bit of a cow, a little bit of psychic power, a little bit of sound the stuff that we read the ancient Egyptians telling us about in their uh, own traditions of the movement of large blocks, that it wasn't done with uh, mechanical advantage and leverage uh, at all. Other megalithic sites that we find, like the so-called so mortuary temples uh, on the Giza Plateau, giant blocks of stone in some cases, in the case of the mortuary temples weighing 200 tons, and then the Bali temple where there are several blocks weighing 100 tons uh, and others in the range of 60 to 80 tons. Uh, the Valley Temple attributed to Khafre. Well, a statue of Khafre was found upside down in a pit in the Valley Temple. That's about the only reason to attribute it to Khafre. Who says he put his statue upside down there? Maybe that was dumped there by some later culture. Who knows what, when? The, the, the claim of Khafre's association with the Valley Temple is very slim. Uh, but I do, of course, accept that the ancient Egyptians were involved in the Valley Temple. I think they were involved in renovating it. I think the granite work inside the Valley Temple and the way the granite is fitted to the much older limestone walls is the work of the ancient Egyptians. But I think they were working on a much older site. And uh, here is the Sphinx, and here is the Sphinx Temple. Here's the Valley Temple. If the Sphinx is older, which is the very strong suggestion of the work of uh, Professor Robert Schock, who was first brought to Giza by our friend John Anthony West in 1990, um, John had an, an, an intimation, actually from the work of Schwale de Lubix, uh, that the Sphinx had been weathered by water, and he thought it would be a good idea to bring a credential geologist to explore that possibility, and so he brought Robert Schock and Robert Schock uh, very quickly re realized that, that it, the Sphinx was indeed weathered by water. Not the way John had thought. John had thought there'd been some kind of flood lying in here. Uh, but uh, what Schock realized was that the water weathering was caused by precipitation, as he was outlining in the, in the talk on the, on, on the bus tonight. And that uh, thousands of years of heavy rainfall had, uh, had created these deep, vertical fissures which are now most easily seen in the trench surrounding the Sphinx because the Sphinx has been continuously restored down the ages. Very bizarre that a monument built in 2500 BC, the Old Kingdom, actually has Old Kingdom restoration blocks on it. Why were they restoring it if they built it then? Mm -hmm. 
uh, the, the sense is that it must be much older than that. And if it's older, then so are these temples, because these temples are built out of limestone blocks that were cut from the trench that surrounds the Sphinx. In fact, the Sphinx's core body was created by removing this area of limestone and building it up into these temples here. Um, and therefore, uh, if the Sphinx is 12,000 plus years old, then these temples are 12,000 plus years old, and that means we're looking at a very high level of technology and culture in that period, which of course is regarded as complete idiocy by mainstream archaeology. Uh, and one of the killer arguments against the older Sphinx uh, back in the 90s was, show me one other site which is 12,000 years old, which is built out of megaliths, you know, show me, so there was no culture in the world 12,000 years ago that was capable of that level of organization. If there was, we would find other sites. And this, see, this was presented as the killer argument of Egyptology against the notion of the older Sphinx, which hugely upset Egyptologists, by the way. I mean, Robert Schock and John Anthony West planted a bomb under the capacious bums of uh, Egyptologists. <laughs> and that bomb has recently exploded in the form of, in the form of Gobekli Tepe, because Gobekli Tepe, uh, which is actually really near the Sphinx, uh, is 12,000 years old. And, um, and this is what you're going to see uh, tomorrow, and this is just to give you a sense of the look of the place and, and the scale of the place. That's me there, and that's uh, Klaus Schmidt, the archaeologist who um, exposed and explored the site since the 1990s, and you just get a sense of the, the gigantic scale uh, of, the whole, of the whole place, and the epic, uh, the epic uh, feel of it, and that it's a series of stone circles in, uh, in, in closures. Uh, and, and what's special about it is that it was deliberately buried about 8,000 uh, BC, uh, 10,000 years ago. Uh, in other words, the site was in operation, at least this bit of the site, between roughly 9,600 BC and 8,000 BC. And, um, and then it was deliberately buried. And that's, that is, um, that's a really important thing to bear in mind because virtually every other megalithic site in the world has not had that privilege of being deliberately buried. Virtually every other megalithic site in the world has been exposed for thousands of years and has been tramped over by later cultures. And I would suggest that the carbon dating record has been contaminated by later cultures who may even have moved megaliths around. And I think that the antiquity of Gobekli Tepe uh, suggests very strongly that we should reconsider the dating of virtually all megalithic sites around the world. I don't think we should buy anything that mainstream archaeology is saying about those sites. What I'm talking about, we're in one of the areas of the new archaeology that's going on at Gobekli Tepe now. Uh, there's a, a huge megalith with a, with a figure of a lion carved into it. And what uh, Schmidt is telling me uh, is that those, the, 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 the main area that we, that we know now, these, these four main enclosures, um, that there, there's at least 20 more of them and there may be as many as 50 of them under the ground that they have not excavated yet. And rather alarmingly, from my point of view, he says that he doesn't plan to excavate most of them. It sounds really good, it sounds really politically correct, we should just preserve the site by never taking a look at it, but honest to God, I would really like to see every one of them excavated, and I'd like to know exactly what's going on uh, at that site. He thinks it might go back as much as 14,000 years. Uh, he expects, because this is his paradigm, that the older material will be simpler. Because one of the puzzling things about the site at the moment is that the very oldest material is the best. And the younger material is much poorer in quality. So he hopes he's going to find a standard evolutionary scenario. I suspect he's not going to find that. I suspect the oldest material is going to remain the best at uh, Gobekli Tepe. And uh, this is the, the unfinished... Uh, megalith. You can see the, the T-shaped form of it, and I'm in the picture just to give a sense of scale. Thought to weigh about 50 tons, was not removed from the quarry because it, uh, it fractured before it was, it was completed. But, uh, you know, we are looking at very serious megalithic architecture here. I think we should be reconsidering Baalbek. I wish we were going, uh, but none of us want to have our heads cut off on YouTube. 
Um, and uh, this is not perhaps the moment to go to Baalbek. Uh, Santh and I have made provisional plans to go back on the 28th of December or thereabouts. Hopefully things will be a bit easier then. Um, we just don't know, you know, what's going on with these, with these gigantic uh, megaliths from Baalbek, which underlie the Roman Temple of Jupiter. I think it's a bit arbitrary of archaeology to give this whole temple to the Romans. Uh, and I would suggest that, that there's a strong possibility that it is a two-phase construction as well, and that the Romans simply appropriated a much earlier megalithic site and built their temple uh, on top of it. And uh, again, if we go back to Gobekli Tepe and look at the generally circular pattern and the whole look of the thing, I think it calls into question the dating of the temples of Malta as well. Uh, which are really quite similar in many ways and which are attributed to the period between five and six thousand years ago. This is Menydra, by the way. Um, and uh, again, Malta, Maltese temples have been tramped over by so many later cultures that the whole carbon dating record is a complete mess. And, and I think that what we're seeing is the reference frame of archaeology, uh, the, the paradigm of the past being imposed upon the evidence. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think Gobekli Tepe puts all of that evidence into question. This is the hypogeum in Malta. It should be on everybody's bucket list. Uh, it is one of the most amazing sites in the world. It's an incredible underground realm, uh, a place, I'm sure, for experiences in altered states of consciousness. I was struck by the, uh, simil some similarities between the hypogeum and Dunkiu, where we went just now. I, uh, Andy and I were discussing this quite a bit. I don't think either of us feel that Dunkiu was ever an underground city. It was an underground place for, uh, for, ex for, for, for experiences which would affect human consciousness, and undoubtedly this is what the hypogeum is, cut out uh, underground, uh, deep under the ground in Malta. And uh, at the hypogeum uh, and around the Maltese temples have been found many examples of these goddess figures, so-called goddess figures, which again mainstream archaeology gives to the period between 5000 and 6000 BC because that is when they are prepared to accept megalithic structures were built. Uh, however, goddess figures we do know go back much earlier than 5 to 6000 BC. Uh, the Venus of Willendorf is 26,000 years old, the Venus of Hull Fells almost 40,000 years old, Vestonici 20,000 years old, La Salle 25,000 years Why should the Maltese Venuses date to just five or 6,000 years just because that happens to fit the picture that archaeologists are comfortable with about the story of our history. Maybe uh, Malta and the Maltese monuments are much, much older uh, than that. I think that, again, Gobekli Tepe raises that question. Inside the hypogeum, you find red ochre marks on the uh, ceiling. And uh, it's interesting because, because of the use of red ochre in the Upper Paleolithic in the, in, the, in the cave art, where frequently you find animal figures painted in, in red ochre. And, um, a good friend of ours, Dr. Uh, Anton Mifsud, who's the chief pediatrician at the main hospital in Valletta, uh, and a very gifted ar amateur archaeologist, uh, is an absolute thorn in the flesh of mainstream archaeology in Malta. Uh, and he, he just keeps digging and finding new stuff, and he's exposed a horrific scandal at the Hypogeum, because it turns out that there was an animal figure painted on the walls of the Hypogeum and it was the figure of a hybrid bison bull. Um, and it was the cause of some arguments between Donald Trump, who was open to the notion that, the, that it might suggest the hypogeum dated back to the Upper Paleolithic, and a certain F.S. Malia, uh, who was the director of the Museums of Malta at that time. Uh, F.S. Malia uh, was absolutely determined that the hypogeum did not belong to the Upper Paleolithic and was not prepared to accept any evidence that might suggest it did belong to the Upper Paleolithic. So when the argument got hot, he simply had the bison bull scrubbed off the wall, oh, and it's gone. Fortunately, there, are, there is some documentation of it, and, and Anton exposed this, this uh, scandal, and I, I put it formally to the National Museums in Malta with very heavy backup from Channel 4, and they just absolutely refused to speak to us. They just would not answer the question. They would not deny it or affirm it, uh, which to me is very suspicious uh, behavior. Uh, so I'm sitting in the Maltese so-called cart ruts with uh, Anton Mifsud here, and you know I have to say some cart, some yeah. ruts, uh, they are thought to date roughly to the period of the temples, perhaps a little bit younger, um, and uh, nobody knows exactly what they are, but they're supposed to be less than 5,000 years old according to mainstream archaeology. So it's inconvenient for mainstream archaeology that if you go diving off Malta, you find cart ruts down to 100 feet underwater. 
Um, and therefore, uh, bearing in mind the story of sea level rise, uh, these carcruts are certainly more than 12,000 years old. And uh, I want to go now from Malta uh, and jump over to the Balearic Islands, particularly to Menorca, uh, which has its own extraordinary megalithic culture, largely given to the Bronze Age about three, three and a half thousand years ago by our friends, the archaeologists. But I can't help noticing the distinct similarity between the T-shaped megaliths of Menorca and the T-shaped megaliths of uh, Gobekli Tepe. There is a difference. These upper parts are separate. They're separate stones. Uh, but the, the overall appearance is incredibly similar to the appearance of the megaliths of Gobekli Tepe. And again, I think Gobekli Tepe is a game changer. And I think it's going to require us to reconsider the dating of all megalithic sites, pretty much all, some perhaps not. And, and then you have the, the megaliths of um, Morocco, which I think we need to be taking a hold. The whole story of the Sahara, you know, the Sahara is like an ocean and it's hiding things as a result of climate change. Sea level rise hides things. The Sahara, the drying out of the Sahara hides things, particularly when we find ancient maps which show huge lake systems in the northern Sahara. This is the Mediterranean Sea, here is Spain. And what are these gigantic lakes doing in the Sahara? You have to go back 12,000 years the end of the last ice age to find lakes like that in the Sahara when the Sahara was green.